we hope the talk held by PSRC today would give you more insight about the Manifest Sora yet and you can compare the offers provided by Sakatai Rayat and also you can take out your newspaper if you buy anyone today, New Straits Times, The Star, Sinju or any of the mainstream media compare the manifesto because in a democracy, a normal democracy, manifesto in a general election is a very important document. Rayat or the people should choose the government based on their promise and their manifesto. The manifesto is, a is an important document because the government, once elected, they can implement the policies immediately without consulting the people. They are the vote by the people or the mandate by the people to the government, to the elected government, is the power for the government to implement policies. And in a normal democracy, policies is the important thing that a civil society need to know, need to be informed. And I'm grateful that we have so many Johorians. May I know how many Johorians here? All Johorians. Oh, any other people from other states? Oh, okay. May I know how many from Benin? Oh, that's a lot of Okay. from uh, East Coast. Oh, you have two. Okay. And Nagris and Milan? Uh, we still have Laka. Great. Sabah Sarawak. Very important. Sabah Sarawak, Johor, Baham are so called frontline states uh, named by uh, uh, Mr. Lim Kitsia and also Pakatan Rakyat. And this general election is will be and hopefully is the turning point for Malaysians and also Malaysians. While Mr. Tony Pua, we can't call him YB anymore. Uh, let me remind you, uh, the parliament is dissolved, the YB is not YB anymore, and the Kataka government is a Kataka government. We should address the so-called Prime Minister as Mr. Najib Tun Razak. We shouldn't call him Prime Minister anymore. And he is not the young Prahimat. And if anyone be elected, that should be the young Prahimat, Yen Yang Brna. And we hopefully today, today talks can give you more insights to the Manifesto Raya, especially, and bring our manifesto back home to your family members and to your friends and spread our words out. Here, I would like to thank Mr. Tony Pua for agreeing to come to Johor. And as a Johor-born politician, I hope he can bring the change home. Okay, let's welcome Mr. Tony Pua. inviting me to this special session this afternoon to present or talk about the Pakatan Rakyat Manifesto which coincidentally uh, the talk came right after the day after Barisan National had presented their manifesto that gives an opportunity for us to do a comparison uh, between both sets of manifestos and for the people to evaluate which one is better for them but before I start, first of all I'd like to apologise for being late uh, I was uh, caught in the snow around the city mall area and, uh, and uh, that also adds the extra pressure on me to make sure that it's worth your time being here uh, to look at our manifesto and hopefully be convinced that it is, uh, it is a worthwhile time for change for Malaysia 
And number two, this is also an opportunity uh, to address uh, a substantial population of uh, English-speaking Johorians uh, who often get a bit left out in our Chiramas, which are either in Chinese or in Malay. So this gives an opportunity for many of you here who, are, uh, who speaks English as first language to present your questions, to ask your questions, as well as to better understand the policies that we want to present. Now, the theme of the policies is really Pakatan Rakyat Manifesto, Real of Love. But some national politicians have been very quick to tell you that it's complete bluff. It is bluff because if we were to implement all the policies that we promised in our Pakatan Rakyat Manifesto, they said that we will very quickly bankrupt the country. That's what they said. Um, and we have taken great pains over the last month after the launch of our manifesto to explain the various policies and the impact on our finances. Whether you have read it on the internet or you have seen it somewhere uh, or bits of it, we're not sure, but this is a platform for us to explain. But what was more interesting for me was when I looked at the Barisan National Manifesto. They claim that everyone knows in the Pakatan Rakyat Manifesto, some of the promises were made include, include lower car prices, lower tolls or abolished tolls, includes free higher education, includes uh, free health hospital services, etc. And they said that all these things added together will actually bankrupt the country. Now if you were to read the manifesto of um, Parisa National, uh, the highlights in the manifesto, for example, uh, then you start to realize, hey, BN also gave a lot of things, huh? <laughs> Pakatan Rakyat gave uh, reduced car prices. We wanted to remove excise duties. Gradually, over five years, 20% off excise duties every year. And Parisa National said the same thing. Oh. They said, uh, what did they say? They said, uh, where is the cars, car prices? Uh, they, they basically said they will reduce car prices. Ah, correct. Revamping the national automotive policy to gradually reduce car prices by 20-30% uh, and increasing competitiveness of Malaysian cars. Same thing, reduce car prices. When we talk about uh, reduce toll, reduce toll, and uh, they say we will bankrupt the country because we will cost, it will cost us hundreds of billions of ringgit. No? And then you read their manifesto again, they have this line here that says, the gradual reduction of intercity tolls. <laughs> then we have promised quite a lot of welfare benefits and we have implemented quite a lot of welfare benefits in the states in which we governed. One of the promises we made in the manifesto for the elderly, Okay, to help the elderly, especially the pensioners, is a 1,000, uh, we usually call it as an anti-raswah dividend, dividend anti-raswah, to be given to old folks above the age of 60 years old as a mark of appreciation uh, for their contributions to nation building. And suddenly you realise that from 500 brim, it is now going up to 1,200 ringgit brim, which is higher than the 1,000 ringgit we promised. And then we have got a very similar set of policies and promises. Increase in affordable housing. You know, they promised to build 1 million houses, including those done by private sector. So we have not included the private sector portion in our manifesto, so it's not a comparable number. But if you include together, I would assume the numbers won't vary significantly. So both also got increased crime fighting in the police force. Now, we have been talking about this for ages. You know, the fact that our police force, we have only less than 9% of the police force dedicated to crime fighting. Another 9% is dedicated to protecting people like me. <laughs> <laughs> but 9% is still not a lot. You have got 30% uh, used for FRU, Light Strike Force, General's, uh, uh, General Operation Force, GOF. All these forces will got 30%. When do they use them? When we have per se rallies. <laughs> and then another 40%. Whoa, from 9%, 30%, now got 40%. What does the rest of the 40% do? Administration, management, logistics. 
So that's how the police force is structured today. Not because we don't have enough policemen, we have enough policemen. By international standards, our police to population ratio is actually quite good. Uh, not the best, but definitely among the better countries in the world. The problem with our police force is the allocation of uh, resources towards crime fighting. And that's one of the reasons why crime has been a major issue in Malaysia, particularly in cities like KL and JB in, in the country. And suddenly you have an increased crime fighting police force. Very soon, we also like. <laughs> increased civil society representation at local councils. They suddenly thought about it. Why they suddenly thought about it? For the last five years, from the very first day, Pakatan Rakyat took over Selangor, Kedah, Penang. What did we do? We included civil society representatives in each and every <coughs> local council. Each and every one. My one was the PJ City Council. In PJ City Council, we have six NGO representatives, not affiliated to any political parties, in sitting as councillors in the local councils. We have five years, we have implemented for five years, Parisian National completely ignored it. Suddenly, in the manifesto, we found increased civil society representation in local councils. Okay, la, we give it to you. So, if you want to follow us, we accept. After all, uh, what do you call it? Uh, 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 plagiarism is a form of flattery, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then we have got the Pan Borneo Express from Smantan Sarawak to Serudin in Sabah. It is in there again. Maybe that's why the, the manifesto came out very late because we were busy copying our manifesto. <laughs> <laughs> so the question is, hey, like this, uh, both manifesto looks the same. Oh. So how? How do you make a decision? They also promise this. Pakatan also promise this. Uh, the only good thing is whoever you choose, you get a lot in return. Uh. <laughs> That's the good thing about two-party system, competition. Last time, that one, now gone. But the bigger question is, and this one, I never agree in New Space Times, huh? but today, I completely agree in New Space Times. <coughs> okay, and there's one more last one that I forgot to mention. Uh, special cash payments of oil royalty to Kelantan and Kregani. We have been fighting for that 20% 20, 20 oil royalty forever, and suddenly, they, they, they say, cannot, 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 Petronas cannot afford it, and then suddenly you say, you have this continuing special cash payments and development and operational funding exceeding 20% of oil and gas revenue to Sabah, Sarawak, Tengganu, Kelantan and Pah. Last time they cannot, now there's this 20% that has appeared in their manifesto. So like I said, both looks the same. So what does the decision point boil down to? And I, as I mentioned just now, I usually would never read news straight time, but today the headline is very accurate. <laughs> it boils down to trustworthiness. It boils down to trustworthiness. Not the guy whose face is on the page. Right? <laughs> but the words are correct. Okay? It boils down to trustworthiness. Who do you trust to deliver these promises? There is no point making all these beautiful promises, but at the end of the day, they don't get delivered over the next five years. So now the decision as to whether the people should look at the Pakatan Rakyat Manifesto or the Barisan National Manifesto, it boils down to trustworthiness. All the complaints about Pakatan Rakyat uh, going to bankrupt the country, all nonsense. Because BN is spending the same amount of money. Okay? So if, in fact, they are spending more. No, we offer 1,000, they offer 1,002. So if we will bankrupt the country in 10 years, they will bankrupt in 5 years. <laughs> so they will be even faster. You know? So the issue of bankruptcy does not arise. That is just pure political propaganda to, to, to discredit our manifesto. The real issue is who do you trust to implement this manifesto. Now I want to go through some of the additional promises that was made in the BN manifesto, which I found Rather curious. Rather curious because this shows um, in, in, in a fairly detailed manner how we cannot trust the BM Manifesto. Just a very few key points, not those minor minor promises, big promises. The first one being they want to increase the number of Kedai Rakyat Satu Malaysia in the country. Now, this Kedai Rakyat Satu Malaysia 
the main purpose is to deliver low cost goods at a low cost to the people so that the people can enjoy lower cost of living. But the problem with Kedai Rakyat Satu Malaysia is twofold. Number one is it's monopolized. No? Even when trying to help poor people, the government tries to let their cronies make money. Only one company runs Kedai Rakyat Satu Malaysia. Who? My name. Now, one year ago, last year, my team was given uh, 40, 42 million to 50 million to build 87 Kedai Rakyat Satu Malaysia. Each one costing in the region of 400,000. Okay, last year. This year, the budget 2013, they gave them they gave them, uh, I can't remember the full amount, but each unit for Kedai Rakyat Satu Malaysia, they want to build 52 units of Kedai Rakyat Satu Malaysia. For how much? For 6.6 .6 million each in Sabah and Sarawak. And this is to open a retail shop where? In Sabah and Sarawak. And each shop will cost the government 6.6 .6 million ringgit. Now, two, foes come, two, two problems come from there. One, obviously the question is what exactly are you selling in these shops? Then you need 6.6 .6 million to, to open it. No? Number two, if these people are going to be able to, what do you call it, uh, uh, these are those to subsidies of all the products to make it really, really cheap. What happens to all the other mom and pop shops that are selling groceries in Sabah and Sanoa? Or Kunshawa? No, you are funding, giving subsidies to one monopoly okay, to sell goods at very low prices to allow this monopoly to make money. Okay? And then who do you harm? You harm all the other mom and pop shops. My argument, our argument has always been, you want to sell goods at lower prices, we support. You want to give subsidies, we support. Subsidies should be given to all existing mom and pop shops that are in Sabah and Sarawak. Why do you need to give it to one person, my dear, to run the shops? That's the first problem. The second problem is, if you sell goods, good quality products at low cost, no problem. I think those people follow my story two years ago, they will know that they sell low cost products at lousier quality. <laughs> okay? uh, you don't even dare to buy some of these products after some of the things I've discovered. The most obvious one being the one when I go shopping with uh, Nuru Hiza for milk powder. Uh, don't, think the, don't think wrong, huh? I go shopping with milk powder. <laughs> It is in the interest of the rocket. Nothing to do with me and me. <laughs> and if VN comes out with a video, don't believe it. <laughs> it's not me. <laughs> Look, these are some of the, 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 the milk powder regulatory requirements under the health ministry that's required in these milk powders. But what I've discovered is that no, all the all the products are missing. These are all the missing uh, vitamins in the baby milk powder. Calcium, they have only four percent, four point five percent of the legal requirement. The iron, they have only seven point four percent of the legal requirement. And uh, they they uh, where areas where they are not supposed to have so much, like vitamin A, they have eight hundred and two percent more vitamin A that is legally allowed. Oh. This is the milk powder sold by Maidin under the brand One Malaysia. They refused, they refuted, they denied everything until finally, after meeting with the health minister, the health minister finally considered after one month that yes, this product needs to be taken off the shelves and uh, the, the manufacturer needs to put in all the required uh, vitamins and minerals in our milk powder so as to not harm our children. The worst case, which is not in this picture, was the fresh milk that they sell. When I first checked the fresh milk, I sent for testing. Came back, testing result of what? Got E. coli bacteria. When I came back, my dean say what? My dean and the Minister of uh, Cooperatives, they say what? They say, Tony Poa is lying. Came out in the NST also. NST also reported. <laughs> Tony Pua is a liar. No? Uh, he probably contaminated it before sending for testing. <laughs> so I said, okay, never mind. 
you send Ministry of Health to do the testing. No? They still lie, they deny all these things. You all know what E. coli is, huh? Uh, comes from where you know, huh? Comes from your large intestine. What's in your large intestines, you know. <laughs> they didn't know. But after one month, finally, again, after denying the Ministry of Health, Minister of Health, they'll tell right, he denies no such thing. We keep stringent check on all our products. But finally, when they tested, results came back, they came public that there was E. coli found in one Malaysia milk. Fresh! Milk. And therefore, all this milk was actually withdrawn from the shelves. Imagine all those people who bought this milk before on the promise by the federal government. See, you buy quality products, you still hear advertisements on radio these days, uh, at lower prices than market prices. So my view is very simple. You want to have lower cost of products, very simple. You don't have to let a middleman make money. <coughs> There's no need for middlemen for lower cost of products. You want lower cost of products? Subsidies go direct to the mom and pop shops. They can supply the goods via existing channels to the people. That's number one. And bigger promises to come. Building, or well, in the promise they say, we want to build a, a 5.3 billion ringgit West Coast Expressway. This is a long story which I can tell on its own, but in brief. This highway was given to a contractor with no experience in building highways. This 5.3 billion ringgit highway was given to Kumplan uh, Europlus. You know who's the boss? Ah? The boss is the Talam boss. Tan Sri Chanachai, yes. Uh, given to, to him, his company, Kumplan Europlus, how much profits did it make in the year before? 20 million. Sorry, wrong. How much revenue did it make in the year before? 20 million. How much losses did it make in the year before? 20 million. <laughs> and they can get a 5.3 billion ringgit highway project. Now, not only get 5.3 billion ringgit highway project, 5.3 billion, a lot of money, right? How will a company with 20 million in revenue go and borrow money to build this project? Don't worry, the federal government will take care of you. We give you privilege, 4% soft loan, 2.3 billion to get you started off. So government lend them the money, 2.3 billion ringgit. 2.3 billion ringgit, man, not enough. Man. What about all the land I have to buy in order to build this highway? Oh, all the land that you need to buy, the government pay for you, 960 million ringgit. So I thought about it. Man. If the government is going to pay so much land new money, pay for your land acquisition, might as well the government bill itself, right? Why give to them and then let them collect toll for 60 years? Now? So they rob you twice. They rob you twice by building the highway using your money. Then after building the highway, they collect toll from you to use the highway. <laughs> this is the promise by Barisan National, included in their manifesto. This is the West Coast Expressway. Then you have got, sorry, the animation got something wrong, enhancing the performance of mathematics and science. Okay? Bring Malaysian education system to the top 33% in the world. <laughs> JB people know very well, you send all your kids next door. When was it that uh, Najib made a message uh, uh, where he said that uh, his report card, ah, government transformation program, uh, he said that. Malaysia will soon have the best education system in the world. I wonder how soon is soon. We agree with this manifesto. We want to make Malaysia among the best in the world. But let's look at Barisan National's track record over the past 12 years. You know? If you look at the international study, trends in international maths and science study, this is an international study over 64 countries, all countries, from advanced countries, developing countries, poor countries. They test 15-year-old students for mathematics and for science. And the tests are conducted in cooperation with the Ministry of Education. So the government cannot say this is some pro-Zionist organization only wanting to defame and smear the good name of Malaysia. Cannot. It's not some Yahudi organization. <laughs> it is an organization in cooperation with the Ministry of Education. 
after testing. They tested four times. 1999, 2003, 2007, and 2011, the last time they tested. Malaysia achieved number one. Obviously, no one will understand. No one will believe that we achieved number one in terms of marks for mathematics. No one here will believe that we achieved number one in terms of marks for science, which is very sad. We achieved number one in that our results for mathematics in the entire world dropped the most from 1999 to 2011. Dropped the most over the 12-year period. 12-year period which includes Najib, four years. We dropped the most in the entire world also for science from 1999 to 2011. You drop one the most, maybe mistake by fluke. You drop both subjects, science and mathematics, the most in the entire world. That is something clearly wrong with your education policy. And that, to me, is the biggest crime of Barisan National. Why? If they are corrupt, they take my money. I always say, take, never mind. I work harder, open my shop two more hours, earn some more money to feed my family. I can earn it back. They take our land, never mind. I earn more money, I buy the land so that I can till the land to earn more money for my family. Never mind. But when they destroy our education system, they are permanently stealing away the future of our children. Our children are not achieving their full potential for only one reason. They are given substandard, poor quality education system by our Barisan National Government. And you cannot take it back. Why you cannot take it back? I cannot send my kids back for another six years of primary school education. I cannot send my kids back for another six years of secondary school education. I cannot send my boy back to three years of university, same course, same university. Cannot. And because we are in a global economic environment today, we have to fight global competitors. If people are improving, we have not improved, then as a result, we will fall further behind. I can go on in another story comparing between countries and stuff. I won't do that here. But today, we talk about the manifesto. And that is extremely sad. And that is extremely poor track record by the Barisan National Government. You know, if you look at rankings, South Korea today is so advanced. For simple reason, you know, they are number one in maths in the world. They beat Japan, Singapore, Taiwan, Hong Kong, UK, Finland, Germany, US. They are number three in science in the world. That's why their companies are so innovative. You see Samsung everywhere today. You see LG everywhere today. Malaysia, we dropped from number 12 to number 20 for maths. We dropped from number 20, uh, 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 sorry, we dropped from number 12 to number 26 for maths. We dropped from number 20 for science to number 32 for science. Some may say, hey, 20, 32, out of 64 countries, still okay, lah, right in the middle, not too bad. <laughs> but do you want to wait for another 12 years when we drop to 40 something, 50 something before you think about wanting to change the government? We cannot afford to play with our children's future. And that is of prime importance to us. And this is proven that over the past 12 years, BN has completely destroyed our education system because our standards dropped by the most in the entire world. Not I say one, not even Anwar Ibrahim say one. Trends, the study for trends in international maths and science study conducted together with the government's Ministry of Education say one. Okay, this is their education track record. And our, 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 our deputy Prime Minister, our Education Minister, can still go up on stage and tell you what, our education system, we should be proud of it. Because today we are recognised as, as we, having, we are having a better education system than UK, US and Germany. <laughs> he said that. Yes. Right? You're all right, right? Uh, yes. No, I say what I didn't defame him. Uh. I'm very scared of lawsuits now. <laughs> <laughs> he said that. Yeah. Straight face. 
I say if our education is really better than UK, US and Germany, I'm asking why do they all these cabinet ministers send their children overseas to study? <laughs> study here lah! So, all the politicking in our education system has resulted in the falling of standards. I can go on and on about education, I better stop there, otherwise I won't finish. <laughs> Somehow what? Fast action! Now, they promised fast action by MACC on AG's report. What did they say here? Uh, fast tracking access to the Auditor General's performance audit report for immediate action. Actually, MACC quite fast, really. You know when uh, when uh, you look at the audit report, uh, all this uh, stuff, uh, screwdriver, 32 ringgit bought for 224 ringgit. Computer laptop, 4,000 ringgit bought for 42,320 ringgit. Car jack. 50 ringgit car jack, 5,700 ringgit they bought. Or the binoculars, the most recent case, 1,940 ringgit bought for 56,350 ringgit. MECC, to be fair, very fast. When this binoculars case came out, immediately sent to MECC, within one week they solved the case. They came out a newspaper report, we have investigated, there was no corruption, I <laughs> quit. <laughs> For those who don't understand what is my queen, that means there was no corruption, they just bought it more expensive. <laughs> 1,940 ringgit, they bought for 56,000 ringgit, no corruption, they just terribly dengan harga yang lebih mahal. Typo error! Typo error! And yet our Prime Minister can come and say, we promise on our Barisan National Manifesto, fast tracking access to the Auditor General's performance audit report. What for you fast track when the outcome is my Beli terlalu mahal saja. Tak terasuah dalam pembelian aset-aset ini. So it is, it is very obvious there's no credibility at all in the anti-corruption uh, 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 policies of the federal government. Now, what's the next one? This one also got to do it. The, the, the in, uh, corruption, implementing integrity pacts for MPs and others, right? So they say, okay, we will sign this integrity pact. In fact, Najib made a show. He signed the integrity pact with some of the ministers standing behind him. The most prominent one standing right behind him when he signed that that the integrity pact. Five months. Five months. I think it's like this. Believe it when they sign integrity pledge. Right? Uh. Mamo sign integrity pledge. Uh. You all saw the video uh, where they all talk about, hey, I know that Mamo very well. I'm his cousin. You know, I count him for you. All your money I channel through Singapore offshore company, escape all the taxes. Elvin Chong. Elvin Chong. Uh. And, and what happened? Oh, MACC will investigate without fear or favor. What did Taib say? Two days ago, what did Taib say? I will not cooperate with MACC which is naughty and dishonest. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and what did Najib say? Say nothing. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Pin drop silence from our Prime Minister who signed the election integrity pledge that we will not in be involved ourselves in the corruption. Are their promises trustworthy? Can they be relied upon? All these proofs, these are just some of the things I quickly pull out. You know, I just got this this morning. <laughs> I have to quickly do, pull something up for, 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 for today's presentation. All this shows that they are not sincere in these promises. These promises are not new. They have been there since Najib came into power. In fact, they have been there since Pala came into power and nothing have changed. Our ranking in Global Corruption Perception Index by Transparency International have declined steadily, not steadily, heavily, <laughs> since but Badawi came into power. Badawi that time was number 33 in the world. Today we are number 56th in the world. We got worse. Other countries are getting better. We are getting worse. Okay. So how can they say they are serious about fighting corruption? A few more points uh, to, to raise public disclosure of contracts. 
mana ada lah. Public when disclosure of contract don't have to be in a manifesto. Who need one? Today I disclose everything. Kau tahu? Why is there a need to promise public disclosure of contracts? You want to disclose this close lah. You know, you want to you want to uh, do a freedom of information act. Do a freedom of information act. You don't wait until election time then you promise this thing. Slango has done it. Penang has done it. We have passed the freedom of information act, and yet in the assembly sittings in Penang and Slango, our Barisan National Aduns, they say what? This is against the constitution to have freedom of information act. That's what they were saying. So how can we believe that they are going to disclose these contracts? For one moment, highway contracts. I think in 2009, after the election, they decided to disclose, but made it very difficult. You must go to their library and read. You cannot take photos. You cannot take a uh, computer. You cannot take anything. Just can read, and then you have to go out. They open it for two weeks, then they close it again. Just have to take a peek. Ah, see, we are old. Cannot get access to anything anymore. IPP contracts, highway contracts, anything. Water contracts. They fight us in court when we try to have public disclosure. To do disclosure of contracts, don't need a promise in manifesto. They can straight away announce all contracts today, barring national defense contracts <coughs> of high sen uh, sensitivity, not your purchase of uh, 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 those uh, four by four wheel vehicles, those are not sensitive, will be made public. Just straight away announce, right? no need to promise one. They won't. And you cannot trust that they will after they win, they win the next general elections. And of course, the last one, oh, we, will, we will have the global movement of moderates. We will promote the principles of moderations in all our undertakings. You saw all the pictures of UMNO people whacking our buses, whacking our cars, whacking our people. <laughs> Did the Prime Minister say anything at all? No. As a moderate Prime Minister, should he not at least, I can understand he cannot control all his members. Very normal, you've got one million members, you cannot control all your members. But as a moderate <coughs> Prime Minister, he should stand up and reprimand those who have engaged in political violence. Did he do that? No. He only talked about his global movement of moderates. He talks about wasatia, oh, Arabic word, so very, very noble. No? But in reality, he tells his boys, go ahead and do what you like, break the buses, break the heads, uh, don't care, threaten them, frighten them into succumbing, frighten the people that if in the coming general election Pakatan Rakyat is to win, there will be violence. That is their purpose. Send the boys in, make the mark so that people get frightened about voting for change. And that completely, uh, what do you call it, uh, 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 undermines his promise of a moderate administration. So these are the, some of the things that I can say very upfront. DM promises that lacks complete credibility. So when it comes to, it's all about trustworthiness. Based on what I have said alone, there's nothing that can be trusted from Barisan National. Now, but it's one thing not being able to trust Barisan National. Can you trust Pakatan Rakyat? <laughs> no, maybe two devils. Uh, throw the devils away and migrate, lah. Uh. <laughs> you know. So can you trust Pakatan Rakyat? Before I go into how we will do our manifesto promises, okay, let me just briefly give you an overview of our financial situation. Why we think that we can carry out our policies. Okay, there's a lot of numbers involved, so hopefully you'll be able to follow. Okay, how we will do it. Now, the government keeps telling us we do not have enough money. We need to cut subsidies. If we don't cut subsidies, we will become bankrupt in 2019. They are saying it so bad that we think that government must be very poor. No, really running out of cash. Cannot collect any more money. But if you look at the record of how much money the government has collected over the past 10 years, revenue has increased from 99 billion ringgit to 209 billion ringgit in just 10 years. More than double in 10 years. Really? What a lot of money, oh. 99 billion to 209 billion, increase of 125% over 10 years. In, and if the government 10 years ago do 
not tell you we don't have enough money. The government today tells you we don't have enough money. Then the question needs to be asked. Where did all our money go? Where did all our money go? This number is not I create one. This is from federal budget numbers. Okay? But your revenues go up. They say not enough money. At the same time, they tell you our debt is increasing to very dangerous levels. So money increase, your income increase, but your debt also increase, which is a very deadly combination. This means that more wastage, and they incur more debt on top of the wastages. Double whammy. Okay? If you don't take debt, you just lose your money, it's okay. But they lose their money and they take on more debt. Double whammy. Their debt has been increasing at a faster pace. First five years from 203 increased by 62%. The next five years, the last five years, increased by 107%. This is how fast our debt is growing. And it will grow some more. It will grow some more, something I will explain in, in a bit. And a lot of these debts are taken, you will notice, towards the end of this period. So we have not started to repay this debt yet. Haven't started paying yet. When we start paying that time, wow, then the country will really be in a crunch. Okay? And that is reflected in your debt servitude. That means your installment payment. This is the payment for that. The other one is your debt level. This is the payment for that. And your payment for that is also increasing at an accelerated place. So this will grow higher, faster, once the debts we are taking today, the loans we are taking today, starts to become payable in a few years' time. And actually, that's one of the reasons why I tell people, we let BN go five more years. Uh, even if we change government after five years, <laughs> sweat. <laughs> don't know where to find the money. They have already spent all your money. They spend not just what they have, they spend what the future have. So you have to start paying off that of your future generation. Now, if they have spent all our money on high income producing projects, that means projects that will bring in higher returns to the people, that's not so bad. Then at least you know that higher income will come in, will pay off your debts, will justify the investment by the government. Okay? But what we see is development expenditure by the government has been declining over the past 10 years. Income go up, huh? remember, huh? income go up, income go up a lot. 125% over 10 years, income go up a lot. But investment have been dropping, dropped by 12.6%. Last time, the proportion of money used for investment is 31.5%. 30, now it's record low of 19%, less than 20% used for investment. So all the money they get are using for operational expenses. Investment expenses like building new schools, building hospitals, building infrastructure have been reduced to only 19%. Despite, I repeat, 125% increase in revenue. This is clear-cut mismanagement of public finances. Ask any economic students, they'll tell you this is oh road to disaster. And if you look at the absolute figure, the blue figure is operational expenses went up by 168%, and the what do you call it? The bottom is development expenditure, uh, expenditure went up by only 21%. Take away inflation, development expenditure over the years has basically remained flat. Everything went into operational expenditure. Operational expenditure is what? Buy table and chair law, renovate my office to be bigger law. Uh, these are operational expenditures. Pay for rental in Putrajaya law, 3 billion a year. Mm. Uh, these are your operational expenditure. And this is where we believe we will make substantial savings if we were to be able to come into government. Okay, I will explain that a bit later, but let me just show you some figures in terms of possible savings. In fact, more than that, but let's just give a cursory look. Supplies and services, buy tables, buy chairs, buy car jacks, buy screwdrivers. <laughs> 2010, just three years ago, huh? three years ago the budget was 23.8 billion. But for some reasons, three years later, my screwdrivers and stuff will cost me 33.7 billion. Ringgit. Went up by more than 10 billion in just three years. Why do we suddenly need to spend extra 10 billion or increase by 42%? on supplies and services. Don't know. To me, so that I can give contracts to my contractors to spend. This is how they dish out their pork barrel politics. Okay? 
grants to statutory bodies. And these statutory bodies, a lot are formed in order to help their political friends. No, I, uh, yeah, I'm no division. Hey, you don't get to become an MP. You don't get some of the benefits. Let me set up a statutory body, make you the chairman, give you some money, then you can go and spend the money. This is your from 12.4 billion increase to 14 billion in just three years. Other expenditure, don't know where it goes on. <laughs> okay, went up from 11.3 to 13.7 billion. If we can just maintain it, uh, don't talk about cutting further, maintain it at 2010 levels, we would have already saved per year nearly 15 billion ringgit. That alone, 15 billion ringgit, and that is more than enough to deliver every single one of the promises that we have included in our manifesto. Just from here alone, don't talk about other savings. Just from the fact that we don't increase by this amount, you save about 12 to 15 billion. From there alone, it is enough to finance every single one of the promises in Pakatan Rakyat Manifesto. Okay? Now, we believe that we can go more than that. But before I go to we can do more than that, I want to show you something even more worrying. I showed you the debt just now, right? Went up to 502 billion. Let me go back to that page. This one. Ah. Went up to 502 billion ringgit. Now this is the official debt numbers. Okay, official amount that the government, uh, federal government owes financial institutions. Okay, the real amount is even higher. Now they don't want to show this go up very much. You know how they do it? Aiyah, if I go and borrow money, I bring into parliament, then after that, Tony Pa make noise, I look very bad. So. Instead of federal government borrow money, the federal government set up a company, 100% owned by the Ministry of Finance. Okay? This company go and borrow money, but federal government give the guarantee. In which case, it is not recognized as a debt of the federal government. And hence, it is not reflected in this figure. And hence, we don't need to debate it in parliament. And that's called contingent liability. Okay? That is your contingent liability that has also been increasing at a very rapid pace in the last few years. Okay? From 97 billion in 2010, went up 20%, 1617 billion in 2011. By end of 2012, it is already 140 billion, or just an increase of 45% in just two years. And it will increase some more. Why? All the big projects you know of that you see in here, everything is off budget. LRT extension, 3 billion plus. MRT project, 53 billion. 1 MDB acquisition of uh, power plants, 10 billion. 1 MDB Tun Raza exchange, 5 to 8 billion. Banda Malaysia, another 5 to 10 billion. Everything done off budget, everything contingent liabilities. And if any of these projects fail, who pay for it? The Rakia pays for it. At the end of the day, if you look at MRT project, LRT project, show lose money man. Guaranteed lose money. And if they are not able to pay their debt, the government have to pay for them. Then it gets reflected in our debt. You suddenly turn up and then we will be in a crisis situation. In fact, this type of debt is really not bad because at least we can find out about it. It's the type of debt that we cannot find out about. Uh. They give guarantee without us knowing. Uh. Uh, that's the hard bit. Which one? By what? PKFZ. Don Ling Yong said sign letter. Guarantee this particular project, the bank land money. Project failed. The government have to bail out. Tan Datuk Sri Chang Kong Choi signed the letter for PKFZ. Gave some more money. Project failed. The government bailed out. From a 1 billion ringgit project, government have to pay so far 4.6 billion ringgit to finance the project out of his pocket. And this cost will increase to 12.5 billion ringgit because the project is not able to sustain itself and with interest accumulated, they will cost the government 12.5 billion ringgit. This debt was not known about. This letter was hidden. You know? As, uh, as uh, Tun Ling Yong said himself said in court, I didn't know what I signed. <laughs> I don't understand the count, so I didn't count properly. These are the ministers who can go to court and now tell you uh, 
I don't know how to count properly, so I didn't know what I signed. Do you still want this type of ministers in place? Ah? Or your Shariza who goes to court and tell you, I don't know what my husband is doing. 250 million to, 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 to rear cows instead of getting cows, suddenly I find beautiful condominiums to stay in. I don't know what my husband is doing. I don't know where his money comes from. Or Tom Dr. Mahate himself. I got an image for it, but I forgot to put it in. No? Some politicians like me, this is his quote, uh, his exact quote. Some politicians like me can be very stupid. <laughs> this was his exact quote. Why did he say that? This was after he retired, when we talked about all these toll companies making multi-billion ringgit in profits at the expense of the people. So he was saying, he was saying that all these contracts, we didn't know about it. They were in the fine print. They gave us what, we just signed what. So that's what he said. He said, because we didn't know anything about it, some politicians like me can be very stupid. That's why all these concessions get signed with these toll companies, allowing them to make billions of money. We should be charging them for dereliction of duty and neglect of their responsibilities. Yes. But this is the scenario I'm painting to you. The scenario is two in summary. Number one, the country has money. Number two, the government today, of today, of the day, Paris National, is burning it away. Not only is it burning it away, they are burning your future generation's income away. And that's why we have to stop it today. We stop it today, we return it to normalcy, we just need to stay clean. Lah. No need to be very clever, right? Just stay clean. Lah. You will already save a lot. Okay? No need to be clever. Lah. And I'll show you how. How we have done it in Slangor and in Penang. In Slangor, very easy. Look for all the cronies. <laughs> Check their books. Ay ya, you still owe me 392 million. Ah. More than 10 years never pay. Ah. Barisan National become government, one cent also never collect. Tan Sri Khalid Ibrahim became Menteri Besar within one year. Every single cent of 392 million was collected back. <laughs> Not I say one. Not Tan Sri say one when that Chua Ti Yong challenged us. Uh. <laughs> he said, I don't know how to count. No, no qualified to debate him. Okay, never mind, I'm not qualified to count. We hired KPMG, international auditors. Went in, did a thorough audit. Audit came out. Every single decision made by the Slangor State Government was done on a sound commercial basis. Every single cent was collected back in full by the Slangor State Government. <laughs> so, the so who do not know how to count? Eh? <laughs> you don't know how to count, or KPMG do not know how to count? So, we will go after these people. Those with that, we will collect them back. We do not want to be like Barisan National. What did Barisan National do? Federal government, Tan Sri Tajuddin Ramli. Remember him? Yes. yes. Oh, all very clever people here. <laughs> <laughs> Malaysian Airlines CEO. Run Malaysian Airlines until 9 billion of that. Tak boleh tahan anymore. No more money. Return it to the federal government. Not return for free, eh? Stock price was 3 ringgit 52 cents. Forced the federal government to buy at 8 ringgit. <laughs> Bail him out. After bailing him out, he still owed the federal government money. 589 million ringgit. You want to be exact? 589.6 million ringgit. <laughs> what did Najib say? I don't know. Our underwear both dirty, so I don't show yours. You don't show mine. <laughs> I rent off 589 million ringgit. Just like that. One cent also no need to pay back. And the worst thing was, the court has already made judgment that 
Tan Sri Tajuddin Ramli owes 589.6 million to these federal government companies. Court already gave order, no, it's not like court haven't made order yet. He decided that this thing's still iffy, we don't want to sue anymore. No, court made the order, Tan Sri has to pay, Najib says, tak payahlah. Kita kawan nama dah. So, this is the comparison. Next, Selangor. Here your rubbish is collected by one company, SWM. In Selangor, it's collected by this company called Alam Flora. Alam Flora is owned by uh, Tan Sri Sat Mokhtar. Okay, you watch my videos, is it? <laughs> Tan Sri Sat Mokhtar. Monopoly. Don't know why rubbish has to be monopoly, but it's monopoly. Whole state privatized to Alam Flora. Everything must give, all rubbish must give to Alam Flora. So, contract ended 2010. Tan Sri asked Alam Flora to come. Come, come, come. Let's look at the contract. You're supposed to do this, 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 this. This you never do, this you never do, this you don't do very well. I want to renegotiate the terms of the contract. Alam Flora said, don't want, go fly kite. They went off. Yes, they went off. And then, of course, there was some hoo-ha because suddenly they went off. We didn't have proper people collecting rubbish, so there were some problems in Slang off. But Tan Sri did not panic. Tan Sri did not privatize to Tony Poir. <laughs> <laughs> And that's why I'm still here. <laughs> Tan Sri did not privatize to anybody. He could have done a very quick decision, quickly privatize to another crony and let them do the collection of rubbish. He did not. He didn't even do a statewide tender to one company because he sees rubbish collection no need monopoly. What the monopoly does is they collect the contract full, but they subcontract every place to all the small contractors. So what Tan Sri did was every local council conducts their own open tenders to select the best contractors at the lowest prices. And of course, there was some learning process because some contractors you select couldn't perform, we select, we find new ones until everything is stabilized after three months. And because of this conversion to an open tender system, every year the Selangor State Government saves more than 81 million. <laughs> then, this one even more fantastic. You know Tanjong Tokong in Penang? Yes. Well, very good piece of land. 980 acres, direct nego, given for one ringgit per square feet, total price 42.7 million ringgit. Under Pakatan Rakyat, Bayang Mutiara, 103 acres, 10% of the previous piece of land, Tanjong Tokong land. Tender openly. How much? Sold for 1.07 billion. Higher by 2,400%. 2,400, not 10% more, no. 2,400% more. This is the comparison you're talking about. No, we don't realize it when we didn't become government. After we become government, then we realize, whoa, okay, I'm going to eat so much. This is the difference. What? Simple, open tenders and transparency can do for you. Another example, you know the Jelutong Highway from airport, you want to go to Georgetown, there's a Jelutong Highway. Jelutong Highway next to it, there's a project called The Light. Very beautiful project. Uh, the Light, right by the straits, you know, good view of the bridge. Okay. Now, Penang no money. So to build that six kilometer highway, they gave away a piece of land to, for reclamation. Okay. They gave it away at one ringgit per square feet. So the highway cost, the highway cost 325 million, they gave away 325 acres. So 1 million per acre. That's what they gave it away for. Now, Penang, we are embarking on an infrastructure project, three sets of roads, including highways, and one tunnel, uh, under bed, sea bed tunnel, across Penang Island to Sperm Prai, all together. How much is how big is the piece of land? 110 acres. Only one third the previous piece of land, and the value of these projects 6.5 billion ringgit. With 110 acres, we are getting in return 6.5 billion ringgit. Last time they gave away 335 acres, they only got 325 million ringgit. Why? We did open tender. International companies came in and bid for it. The company that won the project 
BUCG, Beijing Urban Construction Group. What did they build? You've been to Beijing. Bird Nest, the Olympic Stadium, this is the contractor. They came in and beat, and because of that, we managed to get the lowest price with the best quality contractors. That is the difference what a competent, accountable, and transparent administration can do. You would never believe the scale of difference if we had not been in government. We also don't believe. In fact, for Penang budget, it's quite scary. 2008, Penang budget was only 400 million ringgit. It's actually small because all our income tax pay to federal government. So even though Penang people, mm, relatively wealthy, all their taxes go to federal government, so the state only got land taxes to collect from. So their budget only 400 million. Even though their budget, budget only 400 million, ah, every year still owe money to federal government. Deficit budget, not enough money to spend 400 million. This was under Parisan Lab. Budget how much? 2013. Budget 1.1 billion. Nearly three times 205, 208. Nearly three times. Now, if you increase your budget by expenditure by nearly three times, you would expect your debt to go up by a lot, right? How can you suddenly increase? You know, your income can't be increasing three times over five years. Uh, cannot, uh. So if you increase your expenditure so much, you must be heavily in debt. No. Instead of a deficit, we now have record surplus of 138 million ringgit. So, expenses went up, savings went up even more. It's like beyond logic or no. Last time, expenses small, 400 million only, they owe money. Now our expenses three times more, we save even more money. The question isn't how good Pakatan is. Actually, we can't claim the credit. We can't say it's because we created magic, money grew on trees, that's why we increased our budget by three times. No. The question that needs to be asked is, this money was always there. But what happened to it during the administration? Disappeared. That's why your budget was only 400 million. Because all the money that is extra is already hidden somewhere or transferred out to their cronies like the projects that I told you about earlier. So again, as I mentioned, don't need to be very clever. One. Just need to be clean and not corrupt. And we run an open administration, you will achieve magnificent results under Pakatan Rakyat. So what we want to do after after we win to Kerala yeah, <laughs> is to deal with cronies like this. Okay? To end monopolies. Now will we victimize him? No. We won't victimize him. But we will end monopolies. All the monopolies that we hold, like for example, uh, 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 Pernas, uh, for example, Gas Malaysia, for example, Sugar, all these monopolies, we will introduce competition. And competition will naturally eliminate all those excesses and extra profits that these people are making. We allow people who are more competitive and more uh, efficient to excel in the market. And that's how you create opportunities for Malaysians to grow and become competitive in the world again. Not by protecting monopolies, but by introducing competition so that we can create our own local champions in the world. Okay? Now, I just have one more last example to want to give, to show you, to prove to you that we will not bankrupt the country once we take over. <laughs> one of the biggest criticisms of our, of our manifesto is the highway uh, buybacks or to remove toll from these highways. Barisan National tells us that it will cost you hundreds of billions of ringgit okay, to buy back these tolls. Okay. But we must do it. I'll tell you, it doesn't move so much, and we must do it. We must do it because these concessionaires are making stupid profits. This LDP in my Kawasan, all the other highways are about the same. In my Kawasan, if you look at the accounts, these are published accounts. They make returns of 50% per annum, net profit. This is guaranteed. What? Your traffic sure have to use that road. Right? You've got no other choice. 50% profit. And they are making this 50% profit before price hike. In two, now currently, LDP, the, the toll fees is 160. Come 2016, is 320. And the road is still the same. Huh? <laughs> so you can imagine the impact of revenue to the bottom line. The cost of construction is one point. 
won't be exact, 1.327 billion. They will make 18.8 billion ringgit net profits over a 30 year concession. Average returns of 47% per annum. Oh, fantastic business. <laughs> so, can we just leave it like that? Can we let this crony just continue to make money at our expense over the next 20 years? No. Cannot. No. So we must find a way out, we must buy it back. They say we have to pay a lot of money to buy it back. But I have read through the contract. Remember I told you I went in and actually read through the contract? No such thing. We do not have to pay through the roof. We, it's actually stated explicitly in the contract we can buy back the concession. And it's also stated explicitly at, in the contract how much we need to pay to buy back the concession. Now, these are the concession terms. Okay? I won't go through in detail. Basically, you need to pay for the amount value of construction works. LDP, value of construction works, 1.327 billion. You need to ensure that in the past year, previous years of operation, they have made at least 12% per annum. Fair. That's a fair return. 12% per annum is a very fair return. Okay? But over the past years, every year they have made more than 12%. So we don't have to pay the portion. Okay? And we need to take out any other uh, uh, dividends that they have paid themselves. Okay? And if you look at all the formula added together, okay, we just need to pay 529 million and we can take over the LDP concession. Left, left, left. Not billions and billions of money. 529 million only. I asked in Parliament, no. I asked the Works Minister. I asked the Works Minister how much will it cost for us to buy back. They refused to reply. They say the question of buying back does not arise, so therefore there is no calculation for the amount to buy back. <laughs> they refuse to reply, but outside publicly they will tell you, oh, you cost tens and hundreds of billions of ringgit to, of ringgit to buy back all these highways. All bullshit to scare the people only. The reason why they have to pay billions and billions, very simple. They want to compensate these concessionaires for future profits. Oh, we are taking away the concession. The concessionaire very poor thing. We have to compensate them for their loss of future earnings. Then only fair. It's not in the agreement, huh? Okay? But that's one thing not in the agreement. Is it fair? Is it fair? If I want to pay you for all your future profits, I let you run for the next 20 years, like what for I pay you now upfront your future profits? Does not make sense. Huh? The worst cases are not like cases like LDP. If you are in KL, you will know there's a highway called Max Maju Expressway. KL Street Tallinn to the airport, uh, Putrajaya. Okay. This highway was also built for around 1.3 billion ringgit. 1.3 billion ringgit. To build this highway, the government gave a grant, free money, 960 million to build the highway. So the, the developer, just the concessionaire just needs to come up with 360 million to build the highway. My question is, if you are already giving 960 million ringgit, uh, why do you still need to privatize the highway? You can't afford to come out with another 360 million. So this concessionaire got the contract very easy, go to the bank, borrow 300 million, he only needs to come out with 60 million ringgit. And last year, he sold the highway. How much did he sell the highway? He sold the highway for 1.7 billion ringgit. How much was his own money? 60 million ringgit. Minus paying off the bank, minus paying off the cost of construction, he made clean 1 billion ringgit. Where did this 1 billion ringgit come from? It comes from our 960 million ringgit grant. It's an indirect transfer of government money direct into the hands of a crony. But if we come into power, very easy. The agreement says we just need to pay the cost of construction less whatever that has been paid by the government. Which means we only need to pay the 360 million ringgit portion, not 1.7 billion ringgit. <laughs> so my final call to action is let's not be swayed by the sweet promises in the Barisan National Manifesto. Let's not be beggars to the tidbits that Najib wants to give us. Let us look at the bigger picture. Let us take back the rights to the economy. And let us not let Pakistan National continue to privatise and send 
uh, what you call it, share the economic wealth of this country with their friends and cronies. We believe that the wealth of this country should be shared with all Rakyat via a clean and competitive fashion and not via direct negotiations, crony deals, under-the-counter projects that will only enrich certain people in the government. And only then our country can grow, grow again, grow to its full potential and Malaysians will no longer need to migrate overseas to achieve better opportunities. Thank you, thank you very much. Due to the constraints of the time, I would like to uh, announce that we will have two rounds of question Q and A. Uh, please come in front to the mic and uh, tell us your name and occupation, or maybe where you come from and organization. Thank you. Yeah, there's a mic there. Yeah, because uh, our participants behind may not be seeing your question. Good evening. My name is Guna. I'm from PKR Jogalu. I have two questions here. The first one is your manifesto, the people's well-being. You have mentioned the free port service to all citizens in class two and class three. If you say two, uh, if you say it's free, why do you classify the people in class two and class three? My second question is. My second question is um, the Pakatan Riot manifesto. It looks so interesting, it is uh, achievable to me, it's achievable to people like you, Tony, and uh, Rafizi and all holding it. I think it's achievable, but I don't see anything to curb uh, any project or any uh, future plans to curb the mini Napoleons that we have. Uh, in fact, uh, in Slango, we have uh, mini Napoleons causing trouble for the Pakatan Manifesto. So, I don't see any projects for this, uh, to curb this uh, mini group Napoleon. Thank you. Uh, some more questions, please? Because we will take uh, maybe two or three questions at everyone. Yeah, please, thank you. I am not a member of any political party. Now, I understand that uh, Idris Jara has mentioned on 26 September 2012, two days before Najib announced his budget, that they will actually introduce a 7% GST after they win. Of course, they don't do it now because of the impact. Now, it has not been mentioned in the uh, Barista National Manifesto and neither has it been mentioned in the PR. Now, I think the impact of it is going to be very great. And, and with 7%, that means every dollar that everybody spends, even the poor yeah, will be taxed. And what the BRM $600 will give. Now, if a person earns a basic minimum wage of 900, paying 63 each month, in 10 months, he would have paid back 630. And the BRM only gives him 600. Now, why is uh, BRM not focusing on this issue? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Ms. Lim. Uh, is there any other question? If not, I will, uh, we will take these three first. Uh, and talk. Would you like to comment mm. <coughs> Sorry, looking for the 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 promise uh, by the BN to implement GST. <laughs> Somewhere in here. Okay. Um. Thanks for the question from Mr. Kuna from PKR. It's not a planted question. <laughs> um. Okay. With regards to health thing, I feel like you. I don't have the details, but I suspect it should be free help for everyone, and not just class two and class three. But uh, but it could also be class one because uh, we differentiate between those who can afford it. Uh, but let me let me just get back to you on this because I, I don't have I really don't have the information with me at hand. As for little Napoleons, that's our biggest challenge in terms of implementing some of our policies, particularly in the states. There's no question that we are stuck between a rock and a hard place. You can go hard on the civil servants, and then they'll tell you we don't want to clean the drains. You don't get the drains clean, the people don't care what whose fault it is. Okay, the drains are not clean, we change the government. So that is the, the difficulty where we are stuck. And the only way we have around it as at this point in time 
is to change their paymasters. Currently, many of the civil servants in the state are appointed by the state, but paid by the federal government. Okay, with their, I mean, even the appointment needs their consent. I think you have seen the crisis in Selangor, whereby the federal government actually appointed the state officers without even going through the Tan Sri Khalid's uh, knowledge. So those are the problems we face in our federal uh, state relations with regards to civil servants, and that makes the relationship very dusty. It's difficult to enforce discipline uh, in the civil service under such an environment. You could, you could almost understand the civil servants are themselves trapped. Who do I listen to? Federal government or the state government? Federal government, state government. Who will win the next election? I, I, I throw my bets or I, 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 I balance my bets or I hedge my bets. You know, so those are the concerns we have and the way around it really is to have a one-off, uh, not one-off, to, to actually take over Putrajaya and have a revamp of the federal uh, state relations to ensure that the state will have control over their own civil servants. So that's one of the challenges we face. And number two, uh, with regards to GST, this has been talked about for the last four years and because we have been busy opposing it, that's why it has not been implemented until today. But there is a provision uh, specifically mentioned in the manifesto that it basically means, uh, it basically means, ah, here it is, it basically means uh, GST will be implemented after elections. They would it very nicely so that you will buy it. It's called reforming the existing tax structure towards a more broad-based tax system and gradually reduce income tax and uh, corporate and personal income taxes. So that's GST. Okay. I have no problems with reducing income taxes and corporate taxes. But reducing income taxes and uh, corporate taxes in relation to implementing GST is essentially to make the rich richer, the poor poorer. Now many of us here, I know when I say this, uh, I'm hurting you as well because many of you here already pay taxes. But you are among the 15% working population that's worth paying taxes today. 85% of Malaysians today working net off a bit of those who run away from taxes. Do not pay income taxes. Not because they don't want to, but because their income don't qualify, don't even qualify them to pay income taxes. In fact, that should be a problem and a question to itself. Why after so many years, we didn't even increase the tax bracket, no. After so many years, still so many working Malaysians cannot earn enough to pay income taxes. That is the failure of our national government. So the, re the way to collect more taxes is not by introducing new taxes to tax those people who can't afford to pay taxes. The way to pay, collect, increase taxes is to make sure that this group of people increase their income such that they qualify to pay more taxes to our system. <laughs> but for Barisi National, take the easy way out. Implement it across the board so that someone who is retired, a student, a grandmother, when they buy anything, they have to pay taxes. <laughs> now, a lot of people compare to Singapore. Singapore also got GST one. But Singapore has achieved a certain degree of affluence that when they do a switch from personal to uh, GST taxes, the impact on the poor is not as high. And even then, the Singaporeans are complaining. Even then, the Singaporeans are complaining. In our case, 85% of the working population do not earn enough to pay taxes. Take away 10% bill rate. Okay, 75% of Malaysians do not earn enough to pay taxes and they now want to impose taxes on them because the government, despite revenue, I showed you just now, revenue having increased 125% over 10 years, they still want to tax you some more. So something is seriously wrong with the way this government is managing its finances. And for us, very simple. If the government really no money, okay, they need to collect more taxes, we actually cannot say no. But is it true that government really no money? No, the government, as I've shown earlier, there's a hole in the pocket. There's a hole in the pocket. Now, if you have a hole in the pocket, money is leaking out, and that's why you don't have money. By putting more money into the pocket will not solve your problem. In fact, by stuffing more money into your pocket, the hole only becomes bigger. Yes. <laughs> so, Pakistan has been very firm. It's not mentioned in our manifesto because we do not intend to implement GST. No? Uh, it is mentioned in Barisan National's manifesto. They will impose 
GST after the general elections. We have been very uh, clear cut from the start, it's in our Buku Jiga, it's our co common policy framework, no to GST, no to GST until all corrupt practices, all leakages, all possible other means of raising finances for the government has been completely exhausted, then only you can possibly think about GST. And as we know, there are tens and tens of billions of ringgit that has been wasted at the moment that will, more, that will be more than sufficient to finance all the necessary expenditure of uh, this government, of Pakistan Rakyat, to actually improve the well-being of people without actually having to increase the burden of taxes on <coughs> people. Okay, I thought the the, <laughs> the kid wants to ask a question about the future. Okay, yeah, yeah, we have one. Any more? Yeah, yes, that's right. Hi, uh, my name is Adina. Um, I live in Singapore, but I'm a Malaysian, and uh, I go back to care very often. And uh, one of the very common uh, talks among my friends and my family members is about the safety. And uh, people are very worried, concerned about their kids, their family members. And I would like to know what Pakatan would do with regards to the safety of the public. Thank you very much. Okay, apart from Martina, any other question for the second one, please? Uh, Alex Key from Nabaru. This is a question about education. Okay, we all know that math and science has dropped in the standard. So, I want to ask if Pagran goes to Putrajaya, what would you do and how differently would you do to improve the standard? Thanks. I'm Jing Tai from Sendai. I'm a student. Uh, I would like to ask about the civil servant system in Malaysia. Uh, so I remember Mr. Tony once said that uh, we should downsize the amount of civil servants in this country. So what is Pakatan Raya plan uh, to make sure that the civil servant system in Malaysia works efficiently in the future? Thank you. might come out to the headline tomorrow. <laughs> okay, uh, let's study. Uh, any other? No more. Is it? Okay, please. Uh, hi, my name is Arthur. Eh? Okay, going back to your GST yes. question. Eh? You see, uh, BN government has stated that they will take away the 10% sales tax and implement GST. Currently, anybody who buys anything, most of the things here in Malaysia, you are already paying tax whether you are in or, or out of the tax bracket. Right? It's because of the 10% sales tax that you are paying today. The next question here is that uh, you did talk about uh, auctioning off APs with excise duties coming down. Okay? Now, you are talking about something in the region of about 1.5 billion ringgit of uh, APs, right? But you are also, when you are talking about 1.5 billion APs, what it means is that when the car companies start uh, uh, buying up the auctions, okay, the prices of it will start going up. Even if your excise duties comes down, it will not make any difference. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. How much time do I have? Okay. Trying to decide whether to tell grandmother's story or not. 
Um, I'll start with the easier question. APs. Um, yes, we will auction the APs. We will raise 1.5 billion, which means that whoever who buys the APs will have to pay the government 1.5 billion worth of APs. 30,000 APs. 50,000 ringgit each. That's an estimate. Now, you say that because of this 1.5 billion ringgit, the car's prices will go up. But that's not true. Because what happens is that this APs got market value. I gave Suki, who is my crony, <laughs> give you ten. Now, she's not going to be stupid and give away the APs for free. Some genuine car buyer is going to need the AP to import cars. So how much you want to offer? She will then do the offer and the market price is 50000 The reason why I can arrive at 1.5 billion ringgit is because there is a market price. And the market price is between forty to 60000 ringgit depending on the type of cars you bring in. So 30,000 APs, 50,000 ringgit each, that is 1.5 billion ringgit. It is not created from thin air. Currently, it doesn't go to the government. It goes to the middlemen. So our middlemen are collecting more than 1 billion ringgit of clean profits every year from the AP system. All we are doing is eliminating the middlemen. You really want to import a car, you buy the AP from the government, the government takes the money, you can go and import the car. It does not affect your car prices at all. Mm. So that's APs. Number two, GST. Yes, there is a sales tax 10% for manufactured products. There is a sales tax 10% at the moment. But that collection of tax is only up to 6 billion ringgit. If that is already 6 billion ringgit and the replacement of a new system collects also 6 billion ringgit, then what for you want to change the system? The reason why they want to change the system is because with the new system, they can collect at least 13 billion ringgit. So that's why they want to change to a GST system. And a sales tax system is actually a lot easier to collect than a GST system. GST system, if you've been to Singapore, but pay tax, rebate tax, pay tax, rebate tax. So it's an actually fairly complicated system requiring at least doubling your tax agents, your, your, your tax force in order to manage this system. Those in the accounting line would know. So, so um, there's a reason why they want to improve GST. It is to increase revenue. It is not just about transforming the tax system. They want to collect more money from the people to fund uh, their expenditure. GST, um, education standards, all oh, that stuff. It is, uh, unfortunately, there's no magic pill for education system. Uh, I wish there was, because it affects the future of our children. But the standards have declined to such a stage, you cannot sack half the teachers and replace them with new ones. You just cannot do that. You can try and improve the quality of teachers, but you get incremental improvements. Okay? You can only do it over long term as you phase out older teachers, you bring in better quality teachers. So that is the real challenge that we face. It's realistic. No, I'm not going to promise you tomorrow after we take over, you have world class education system. <laughs> no. But what we can do is start our process to get back at some stage to a world class education system. You start by introducing some degree of competition in our schools. At the moment, what the Barista National do is to dump down all our schools so that it's easier to get all A's. In the recent SPM results, record number of people get straight A's. 15,000 people got straight A's in SPM. Wow. Our minister say our students now all very clever. <laughs> but how did they get 15,000 straight A's? Teacher tell me, teacher tell me one, Additional max to pass today, 15 marks. Oh. Not 50 marks, huh? 15 marks to pass. Everything comes down. So all they do is they generate their KPIs. Every year my KPI increase the number of straight A students. I don't care whether exam is simpler or whatever. I just bring it down, make sure that I achieve the 15, uh, the, 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 the increased number of straight A students. That has to go. You must have a degree of rigor and competition in the education system. You don't get smarter students by making exams easier. That doesn't work. You just don't get that. Okay? Now, in fact, they are, they, are, they, 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 they are doing something which I am very opposed to. Uh, although there are, there, are, there are some arguments for it. They are eliminating exams. 
They say, let's not stress our students. Huh? Let's take away the exams. You know, they wanted to take away PSR, they wanted to take away PMR. So PMR has been taken away. That one, I don't object so much. You still have your SPM there. But UPSR, they, after we objected, they changed a bit. They said now we do school space assessment. So they're still tested by school space. The teachers in the school will not. I want to ask a very simple question. Simple human incentive question. Nature of humans. Which teacher will want to fail half their students? <laughs> Even if they deserve to fail, would a teacher trouble herself to fail half a student, then get called up to the principal's office? What the heck have you been doing for the past year such that you'll half your students fail? So it becomes a vicious cycle. They have control over the marks of the students, so they can control how much they want to teach. The rest you come to my tuition class. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> So, under such circumstances, your standards are only going to get worse. Singapore has done it, not to say other people don't have. Singapore has also done it. You go to Raffles Institution, Raffles Junior College, or the other top schools like ACS and so on, they have done away with O levels. Go straight to o, A levels. From O, go straight to A levels. But that's only for select schools, top schools, where you know for sure these students are not going to Churi Ayam. Where these students, you know, are clever because they come from better families who know that they have to push their education. But for the other rural students, especially in Malaysia, without exams, there's no more incentives to study. No more incentives to study. For people like me, I'm thankful because I know I will make sure my kids study, whether or not there's exams. So my kids will do fine. But for the broad majority of Malaysians out there, they don't have this privilege. I'm privileged, but many Malaysians are not. And it's the role of the government to ensure that those who are not privileged get the best education system. And this is where they are failing. This is where it becomes a joke when the minister is more interested in making history a compulsory pass. <laughs> Announced in the UMNO General Assembly. Okay? Then say, for example, making English a compulsory pass. Uh, finally, it is in the manifesto. They say they will make English a compulsory pass. Very easy one. Right? Make it easier. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's Alexi's education question. Safety. I think um, um, uh, I dealt a bit with safety just now with regards to reforming the police force. But one of the key issues we have on safety is the manipulation of statistics. Our government tells us we are very safe now. You all feel safe, right? No. They tell us our street crimes has gone down by 40%. Not 5%, 8%, no. 40%. They tell us our overall crime has gone down by 15%. Wow, very good achievement now since Najib became Prime Minister. For a very long time, we couldn't rebut. rebut. We couldn't rebut statistics because they created their own statistics. Okay, so we don't have any other evidence other than anecdotal evidence from the people. Then, a whistleblower came up with some information published in the newspapers. We found out that there are two sets of statistics. One called the index crime, the other one called the non-index crime. What? I thought crime is crime, how about index crime and non-index crime? <laughs> index crime, from year 2007 to 2009, Reduced by 25%. Wow, very good. Okay, what is index crime? Index crime is like Suki. I go to her, pay me money. My visa, pay me money, or I hit you. She pays me money, that is an index crime. I go to her with a pen knife, I say, pay me money, or I, I chucho you. <laughs> she pays me money, that is an index crime. But if I have a knife in my pocket, I didn't use it, pay me money. She gives me money, I run away, I get caught. That is a non-index crime. <laughs> Why? Uh? <laughs> the explanation given, oh, this lah, whether it's a pen knife or a nail cutter um, in the pocket. Therefore, the crime is classified under intent to cause harm. Didn't cause harm, just intent to cause harm. So it is a lighter crime, therefore it's a non-index crime. 
So what they do, start finding things in their pockets. Uh. And we classify crime to non-index crime. I'll give you another better example. Burglary. Now, I go into somebody's house. Break into the house, found jewelry, found passport, took it away, run. Index crime. I break into Suki's house. I forgot she's from DAP. No money, right? <laughs> Break her plates, throw out all the stuff in the cupboard, try to find hidden jewelry, money, anything. Nothing. I live empty handed, non index crime. <laughs> so, what the, the, the police have been doing is busy shifting or reclassifying crime from index to non index crime. What the government published is only index crime. We never knew that there was a non index crime. But some police officers seem to have found out and they put out an anonymous letter and when we ask, although no details are given, we found out. Index crime 2007 to 2011 reduced by 25%. Non-index crime over the same period from 2007 to 2011 went up by 69%. <laughs> this is how the government manipulates statistics to cheat you. So I asked in Parliament, not to say I didn't ask, I asked in Parliament, please provide breakdown of all non-index crime, okay, in every state, under all categories. Answer came back from the Home Minister, Dr. Sri Chiang Wong Sin, your, your Home Minister also, Sembrong. Those from Sembrong here, make sure you get rid of him. <laughs> you know what he said now? Non-index crime is trivial crime. So there's no need for us to give you the statistics. <laughs> the parliamentary convention is, if I ask how many cows are there in this country, it doesn't matter how stupid the question is or how trivial the question is. If the government has the statistics for how many cows are there in this country, they provide me the statistics. It is my business if I ask a stupid question. In this case, I'm asking about the breakdown for non tax crime. I'm asking for the breakdown by state by type of crime, by district, they refuse to give these details. Which only proves to me one thing, they have something to hide. The police, the Home Minister, the Parisian National Government are not being honest by telling us that, hey, look at our report card, our crime has gone down by 25%. All bullshit. And even if it did go down by a bit, it is because we have started walling up all our tamans. You go into any taman now in JB, in PJ, in KL, it's all boom gates. We hire our own security guards. We have to fork out our own money, pay extra taxes to hire security guards to protect our family. And the government is trying to claim credit for that. And I think they don't deserve the credit. When we come in, what we will do is we will increase the number of police officers to be fighting crime. 9% is ridiculous. We should be having at least 30% of police officers to fight crime because that is the single basic most important function of the police force to ensure that Malaysians can live peacefully without fear for their lives and their loved ones. <laughs> Last question can do want to answer. <laughs> Jinkai asked on the civil service. The last time I answered this question, also in Johor Bahru, <laughs> I got into the front page of Mutusan Malaysia. <laughs> I think my answer then was very simple. And I'll repeat the answer here. Because, I mean, camera now is live on Duba.tv. So you all want to watch any drama live, it's on Duba.tv. And this one here. <laughs> answer is very simple, but it was twisted by Mutusan Malaysia. All I said was very simple. We have to think of schemes okay, in order to uh, uh, allow some of the civil servants to retire voluntarily. No compulsion. Voluntarily. That means it must be some benefit that they like that they can go with. Or the non-performing ones, they must be find some ways to deal with the non-performing ones. We must have very clear KPIs and standards. And all I did was to repeat exactly what the Prime Minister said in his 2013 budget. 
He said exactly the same thing. It was written in his speech, in his budget. But when the Prime Minister said, it's okay. When Tony Paul said, he's racist because he wants to cut down the civil service. And that's how to some Malaysia will pay. Okay? We can't cut down civil service just like that for a very simple reason. It is just not practical. Yes, we have a bloated civil service, but we cannot tomorrow say, come into power, let's take away 20% of it. The morale goes down, they stop working for you, that's it, end of this government. So there has to be a way over a long term to look at changing the structure of the civil service. Not by just imposing an outright cut, say 20% of our morale, over size by 20%, let's immediately remove 20%. It does not work like that. In practical real world terms, it just cannot work like that. Okay, we need them to help us. We need to, at the same time, understand the situation they are in. A situation that they did not create. Because this situation that they find themselves in was created by the Pakistan National Government. So we have to help them at the same time to extricate themselves from this system to make sure that they are able uh, to, to, to survive, to live and to work uh, under a new administration as well. So those are the challenges we face. It's no bit of roses. Uh, but if we work hard at it, like I said, we just stay clean. Don't take money. Treat the people's money like your own. Not the type like PNs, your own means your own money. <laughs> like the way you would value your own money. Then I'm sure the rakyat will automatically benefit. I'm sure, I'm sure Malaysia will do a lot better. Thank you, thank you very much. here as well. Uh, I'm quite honoured to have another, hopefully, <laughs> the, another members of the cabinet in Pakatan Raya government, hopefully after election, to come to Johor Bahru to give another talk next week. Uh, the title will be Pakatan Raya versus Barisan National, which coalition has the better economic policies. Uh, the speaker would be Saudara Liu Chin Tong, and also it will be organised uh, by PSRC and I will inform you all if you do leave the email here because uh, we are yet to get the venue and, uh, and and the time so we will inform you all by online email and SMS so please do your contact number here and we have a uh, merchandise booth outside you can get Tony's Poirot's book and also other English book published by uh, other leaders or uh, other very good writers about Malaysia politics and economics Thank you all for coming our talks today and hopefully to see you all.